Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you're tuned in, you are joining us for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative monthly seminar series. Um, we are gonna give a few minutes for folks to populate in the room. So this is a good time to uh, go ahead and uh, settle in, um, check your audio, and we'll get started in a minute or two just after to allow folks to populate into the room. So welcome. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome back from the turkey holiday season. Um, you're joining us for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative monthly seminar series. Um, so in for a special treat today, we have one of our doctoral students, um, Umar Bakali, uh, who will be presenting. Um, you know, one of the things that we frequently engage with in collaboration with our firefighters is how to best assess occupational exposures. Um, that are sustained in the work environment, either through fire incident response, training exercises, or disaster management. And in the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, one of our, our pillars and programs is led and driven by our Department of Biochemistry, Dr. Sylvia Donner, uh, Sapna Deo, and other members of the department. Our students are the most important. Um, they're our future and often lead many of the projects that are done through, through this initiative. Today, we're joined by a um, doctoral student who's no stranger here to the FCI seminar series, um, Umar Bakali, um, who is currently, uh, I'm not going to say what year because he doesn't want me to say <laughs> probably what year, but he is a, a doctoral student in the biochemistry and molecular biology department at the University of Miami and member of the Firefighter Cancer Initiative since 2017. Um, he uses various analytic techniques to help identify and evaluate occupational exposures to carcinogens that are encountered by, by different firefighter uh, groups. So today he'll be talking to us about um, the design development and deployment of the methods that are used for occupational exposures. Um, you are welcome to ask questions of him. Um, you can pop them over into the chat and Dr. Natasha Sally and I will be moderating those questions um, for Umar at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, Um's the floor is yours. Appreciate it, Dr. Hvan. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Umar Bakali. I'm a doctoral candidate here. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the work that the Environmental Sampling Program does. Uh, I wanted to get started first with um, a bit of a primer on cancers and exposure in the fire service. Uh, this is something that if you're tuned in here, you probably have some idea of already. Um, so back in June of last year, the International Agency for Research on Cancer reviewed the practice of firefighting, the profession of firefighting, and declared it a group one or known carcinogen to humans. And, you know, if you're joined in here, this is probably something that you already knew. Uh, what we found, though, in the most recent meta-analyses from, meta from May 2023, where uh, our very own Dr. David J. Lee here at UM uh, had a meta-analysis for firefighter cancer incidents from 38 studies between 1978 and 2022, uh, there was an increase in incidence in firefighters for skin and prostate cancers and a higher rate of mortality from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, rectal, and testicular cancers. Now, for the audience, especially those who have been here for previous seminar series, this, li this list seems a little bit short. Um, to me, it seems a little bit short anyway. Um, ultimately, what this speaks to is a need for more high quality research that can confidently link firefighters' exposures to their health outcomes in a manner that's based on molecular mechanisms and throughout a longitudinal time frame. And overall, this will help reduce the amount of shifting that we get from the conclusions from meta-analyses and help really elucidate uh, the exposures and the health results of the fire service and help uh, increase prevention as well. 
Now, predominantly, the environmental sampling program has focused on the use of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, or focused on assessing polyaromatic hydrocarbons as the primary analytes for uh, firefighters' exposures. These are IARC uh, group one and group two carcinogens that are produced during uh, the process of incomplete combustion. So essentially, whenever you have a fire that burns a carbon-based fuel, so practically any fire, if you're a firefighter with very few exceptions, anything from paper to wood to grease to gasoline to diesel, you have the potential for producing PAHs. This occurs when you have a fuel-rich and oxygen-poor environment. And what happens is instead of just producing carbon dioxide and water like you would have in complete combustion, what you have is instead the production of aromatic rings that can coalesce and form multi or poly aromatic hydrocarbons. And if you let this go on for long enough, this can actually produce the soot that you see, the smoke that you see arising from fire. Now, predominantly, the firefighter's occupational exposure starts at the fire scene. Uh, at an active fire situation, this is where you're going to get your uh, toxic um, uh, compounds, the soot, the pHs, BTEX, and other volatile uh, carcinogens. And these can settle on the turnout gear. Now, the turnout gear really serves as kind of the vector for a lot of firefighters' exposures. When the turnout gear, for example, is worn while in the engine uh, on the ride back from a fire, let's say, uh, that can potentially contaminate the interior of the engine and produce uh, a hazard for other firefighters who occupy that, who occupy that space later. Uh, if the turnout gear is then taken from the engine and then brought into the living quarters or the dining area of the fire station, now that can potentially contaminate that area as well. If for some reason the turnout gear or whatever PPE that a firefighter uh, wears is then transported in the personal vehicle of that firefighter, it can contaminate that space and then potentially also into the home, exposing the firefighter's family and friends. Now, we should note that it's not all doom and gloom here. There's been lots of changes in protocols and behaviors over the past few years that have helped reduce contamination spreading from turnout gear, dirty turnout gear, starting with gross on-scene decontamination, right? So the green buckets, just simply cleansing with dish soap and water is enough to get a lot of that contamination off or at least prevent it from aerosolizing, uh, to storing turnout gear in a compartment that's separate from the interior of the passenger uh, area of the engine, so the clean cab concept, uh, to making sure that firefighters decontaminate themselves, shower within the hour after a fire situation. As for routes of exposure, there's three principal routes uh, for pH exposure and exposure to other compounds. Uh, there's inhalation, of course. Uh, this occurs mainly when the firefighter is doffing their turnout gear, or perhaps if there's no good access to respiratory protection, like these pHs or other compounds can be inhaled. Uh, there's ingestion, which occurs if some of the compounds fall into the food that a firefighter eats, or uh, say like the firefighter is hydrating without decontaminating, uh, that can potentially expose them through ingestion. And then through dermal deposition, which involves simply not decontaminating quickly enough and having these compounds uh, deposit and absorb, be absorbed through the skin. Once these pHs are internalized, their carcinogenicity is based on the fact that the body tries to get rid of them. What I mean by that is that the pHs by themselves are procarcinogens, but when the body tries to get rid of them, it produces a very reactive species that can produce DNA adducts and can lead to dysfunction of transcription and replication pathways that can ultimately lead to cancer. So let's start first with uh, the exposure assessments that we've done with structural firefighters. And this really is um, starting classically with uh, uh, the silicone wristbands. Um, for those of you who have seen the FCI for a while, this is kind of etched into the lore of the FCI, if you will. Uh, they're very effective exposure monitoring tools, and a lot of that comes from the fact that they're if you were to put them under a microscope, you'd find that they have a very porous microstructure. They, these pockets in, in the structure are basically what allows it to capture volatile and semi-volatile compounds in the air around the firefighter. They're really cheap, uh, cost-effective, they're not invasive, uh, they're very durable, they're fire resistant, and overall, these are all really big advantages considering that other sampling methods which are more cumbersome, require batteries, can weigh the firefighter down. Uh, this, this is really a much more simple way to go, especially for 
for assessing lots of firefighters' exposures at the same time. So not bad for a concert souvenir. To first, um, you know, deploy these silicone wristbands, what we have to do is prepare them using solvent washes, and that's to get rid of any extraneous contamination that was already on the wristbands before uh, these, uh, before we extract them and have them actually at the fire scenes. Um, after they've been solvent washed, they go through a vacuum oven treatment for a minimum of 16 hours, but usually overnight, and that makes sure that all those harsh solvents are completely taken off of the wristband, so that by the time it ends up on the firefighter's wrist, it's not liable to cause any exposure. And then after being deployed, the wristbands are then returned to the lab. We extract them through a solvent extraction and then analyze them through GCMS. For those of you who are into forensics, GCMS is, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry, is basically a separation method that allows us to separate out different compounds inside of an extract and analyze them uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. In this case, we use them primarily to look for the 16 EPA priority PAHs. So one of the very first uh, experiments that we did, before we can even begin to talk about exposures at fire scenes, there's already something to be said about exposures and contamination within fire stations. So on the right here, uh, that soot on the finger right there is from an ice maker on the inside of a firefighter, uh, or sorry, of a fire station garage. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't really want to have soot with my soda. And what we found was from just placing wristbands around in different, fire, in different areas of the fire station, whether that be the living quarters, the dining area, in the garage, we found pretty significant exposures to pHs overall. And these findings in, uh, in, in conjunction with other experiments uh, that have been done by other authors have really set the precedent for improving air quality within fire stations and discouraging bringing contaminated gear into the living quarters. Now, as I said before, turnout gear after a fire scene can also be a potential exposure source. So one way that we were able to measure this was by having turnout gear that was recently fire exposed, so exposed within 72 hours and not recently fire exposed, so exposed uh, greater than 72 hours prior, uh, in large Pelican cases, in which we had silicone wristbands. And what we found was predictably that more recently fire exposed turnout gear had significantly higher uh, concentration of PHs on the wristbands. And this really highlights the need for on-scene decon. Now, the meat of this was, of course, uh, comparing firefighters' exposures while going to a fire situation and to those who did not report going to a fire situation. What we found was that, on average, there was a 42% higher pH concentration on wristbands that were worn on fire scenes compared to those that were not. Now, every single pH has a part in telling a story about where exactly the contamination comes from. Uh, lots of other authors in the past have done studies from an environmental sampling angle, so not necessarily an occupational exposure angle, but still useful nonetheless, in which they compared concentrations of certain pHs to concentrations of other pHs. So for example, fluorine over here, uh, divided by the concentration of fluorine and pyrene, uh, if that ratio is greater than 0.5, that points to diesel emissions as the source. Uh, similarly, other compounds or other pHs have other uh, sources that you can be that you can use to attribute exposure to. And what we found was, uh, in these charts are a little bit busy. Uh, these green X's here are firefighters who reported uh, not going to a fire situation, and the red O's are those who did. Uh, what we find overall is even though that we know that there's a difference in magnitude of PAH exposure between firefighters who didn't, uh, who didn't go to fire situations and those who did, uh, what we find is overall, they have the same tendency for exposure. So in the highlighted areas, it's really a lot of combustion, which of course, if you're going to a fire or you know, have contamination related to a fire, and a lot of it is furthermore related to diesel combustion, which is really a hallmark of exposure to being close to a fire apparatus. And we'll get more on that later. Another thing that we looked into is what about the location of the fire scene uh, or how, what distance from a fire scene allows you to get clear of exposure. So typically at a fire response, there's three uh, zones that are 
that a fire response is divided into. There's a hot zone, which is the area that has an immediate threat to life and health. The firefighter is always going to be in full turnout here in an SCBA. A cold zone that's considered to be safe, and a warm zone, which is in between these two. And in the warm zone, there's a lot of busy, uh, it's, it's really busy. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's EMS operations, staging operations, uh, firefighters are donning and doffing gear, conducting on scene decon, so on and so forth. Now, is the warm zone really all that safe? And in initial experiments uh, conducted by Dr. Kavan. Uh, with VOC sensors indicated that the warm and cold zones really aren't as safe as expected, at least in terms of exposure to volatilized uh, carcinogens. So what we did was we deployed wristbands at various areas or various distances from the hot zones of two different live fire trainings, a class A training and a class B training. And overall, what we found was that the class A training had substantially more exposure, and this is largely due to uh, significantly more uh, soot smoke that's produced by a class A training that's, that's, being, that's burning uh, pallets and hay compared to a much cleaner class B burn that was primarily fueled by propane. Uh, but what we see in both that's quite interesting is a deposition front. What I mean by that is there's an area uh, at a certain distance from the fire, from the hot zone, that has significantly more pHs in both situations than the areas further away and the areas that are closer to the hot zone. And what this is believed to be the result of is that when a fire generates smoke, uh, that really hot smoke first rises into the air and then begins to fall back down. And the kicker is that this is precisely where the firefighting, the the warm zone of the active fire scene would be, right where uh, firefighters may not be fully dressed in protective turnout gear. And this really highlights the need for an active analysis of volatile carcinogens in the warm zone, which we'll get to a little bit later. Let's move on to another subgroup uh, where we assess exposures in fire investigators. So fire investigators are a very underrepresented, um, at least in research, uh, population in the fire in the overall uh, total number of firefighting personnel in the US. So the US Bureau of Labor Statistics says there's approximately 15,000 fire inspectors and fire investigators, and that's that number combined. Uh, the International Association of Arson Investigators estimates that the number is closer to between 7,000 and 9,000 that are just fire investigators. Compared to the 1.1 million uh, total firefighting personnel in the US, that's less than 1.5% of all fire, fire service personnel. And predictably, there is next to no literature on fire investigators' exposures that is specifically targeted to fire investigators. A lot of what is known is simply gleaned off of exposures from other groups of firefighters. So that's something that we intended to change. Now, occupational characteristics of fire investigators are a little bit different from structural firefighters. So they can be present at multiple post-fire scenes for hours at a time. It's not just one. Uh, in the best case scenario, they're fully dressed in bunny suits, lighter Tyvek suits with gloves. Uh, ideally, they have SCBA or at least respirators with filtered cartridges. But again, this is the best case scenario. Not all fire investigators have access to this PPE. The gear that they use must always be laundered. Sometimes they don't have time for that. And sometimes it gets very difficult to use the PPE perfectly. So to assess fire investigators' exposures, we again use wristbands and we assess them for 16 EPA priority pHs. Uh, we had fire investigators um, go to 46 different post-fire scenes uh, and conduct their usual audits between January of 2020 and September of 2022. And what we found was significantly more lower molecular weight pH, so these first six over here, uh, contamination than anything else. So 90% of the overall contamination was due to just these lower molecular weight pHs. And this is, kind of understandable since these fire situations, they're not elevated in temperature anymore, at least not very high. They're closer to ambient temperature. And higher molecular weight pHs are less volatile at these lower temperatures. When we compare the amount of exposure to the time spent by these firefighters at post-fire scenes, we do have a moderate positive correlation between the two. Uh, but this doesn't explain everything. The International Association of Arson Investigators defines post-fire scenes by their age. Uh, so briefly, they're 
uh, divided into hot scenes, warm scenes, and cold scenes based on the amount of time that's passed since the fire was controlled. And different fire scenes have different levels of off-gassing contaminants. So when we compare the wristbands worn by fire investigators who were at hot scenes, ones that were recently extinguished within a day, uh, compared to warm and cold scenes, what we find that their pH exposures at hot scenes are approximately three times higher on average when we normalize by time. Furthermore, the majority of these 46 investigations occurred at hot scenes, around 61% of them. So when combining these factors, you have a persistent off-gassing of fire scenes. You have lots of hours of, uh, spent at post-fire scenes, very light PPE. We can say for sure that fire investigators sustain significant pH exposure. Another subgroup of firefighters that we looked at were wildland firefighters. And this was something that I was a uh, recipient to a pilot grant fellowship from uh, the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety uh, for assessing. So wildland firefighting is another subgroup of firefighters that's very different That's diff very different from structural firefighting in that they use lighter fire resistant gear. Uh, they have lots more vehicles at their disposal and generally limited access to water makes it harder for them to decontaminate and very little to no respiratory protection. That's really key. Uh, in other literature, it's been found that wildland firefighters, depending on their seniority, are estimated to be up to 43% more likely to develop lung cancer compared to the general population. This is really hearkening back to the fact that they have very little to no respiratory protection because it's hard to carry SCBA tanks that are only going to last 30 to 45 minutes out into the wilderness. You're going to be going through a lot of tanks. By comparison, from a recent meta-analysis from 2020, structural firefighters are at a reduced risk of lung cancer compared to the general population. Partly because of the healthy worker effect, I would imagine, and partly because of the stringent use of SCBA. Now, obviously, to assess wildland firefighters' exposures, we can't just go about setting uh, wildland fires. The best thing that we can do is test for their exposure at prescribed burns, which are deliberately set in order to reduce the amount of accumulated fuel on the floor of a forest and to maintain fire-dependent ecosystems. It makes it so that any future wildland fire will be less severe. It'll be harder for it to start, and it'll last a much, a much shorter time. And prescribed burns are much more controlled than actual wildfires. So there's a bit of a caveat there. You know, there's shorter time frames there. Uh, and there's a higher degree of control of ways to approach it that may limit or distort the amounts of exposures that we see. So I, we went to two prescribed burns, uh, one in Pine Log State Forest in the Panhandle, just north of Panama City Beach, uh, and another in Lake Wales Ridge State Forest in Central Florida. And these two at first are a little different, or a lot different actually. Pine Log State Forest was only a 47 acre prescribed burn, and Lake Wales was about 430 acres. But overall, the types of fuels and the weather conditions were quite similar. So first at Pine Log, what we were able to do was uh, have wildland fire participants wear wristbands for a baseline measurement over a 24 hour, over their over a period of 24 hours the day before the prescribed burn, and then we conducted a wristband assessment where they wore uh, the wristbands for two and a half hours during that prescribed burn. And what we found was the average exposure during the prescribed burn was about two and a half times higher. Now, this isn't time weighted. They sustained two and a half times more exposure in only a tenth as much time. So significantly more exposure in a very short period of time. At Lake Wales, predictably, since, since it was a much larger and much longer prescribed burn, we had even more exposure. Uh, and when we compare them side by side, what we notice is that lower molecular weight pH is accounted for the vast majority of pH exposure. Uh, but this is possibly due to the fact that wristbands are a little bit biased towards the collection of gaseous compounds, not just particulate bound ones. And specific pHs such as phenanthrene, pyrene, and naphthalene uh, were pronounced in both burns, likely because of similarities in the fuel and burning vegetation. Well, is pH exposure at wildland fires a function of time or acreage? And that's more what we find anyway, a, a function of time at the burn. When we take a look at the exposures overall, uh, the spread of the exposures and the averages, what we find is that both burns are exposing their participants at similar rates. 
what we also did was uh, in to complement the ambient exposures that we assessed with wristbands, uh, we also did dermal sampling with alcohol swabs. So we, uh, we selected a few different types or uh, selected a few different regions on the body for firefighters to self-swab and sample themselves uh, before and after the prescribed burn. And what we found uh, was that the neck area specifically was very, very high in terms of uh, total pH concentration per square centimeter uh, compared to the others. The neck, the laryngeal prominence of the front of the neck where the thyroid is, and also in the groins. And this is possibly explained by the fact that these are the areas in which it's easiest for air to get in. Uh, the legs are usually completely you know, covered by the pants. The groin area is where the seam, you know, the top of the pants meets the bottom of the turnout gear jacket, so possibly a little bit more air can get in. And the arms are similarly covered by the sleeves as well. Uh, also, predictably, uh, the larger prescribed burn, or the longer one, rather, uh, had more pH exposure than the shorter ones. Now, I'm going to move on to the development of real-time sensors. This is work that's being done by my colleague, Chifan. Uh, who uses it for active sampling for the fire response environment. And he was featured recently on a UM press release. So why have an active sampling method? Well, wristbands can give us a really rich and detailed image of firefighters' exposures, but the exposures that we see on them is something that's already happened. It's not something that we can do anything to change except for changing behavior later. But active fire scenes, or active sampling rather for active fire scenes, allows us, gives us a chance to have behavioral modifications, to move out of the way of exposure. Uh, existing real-time sensors right now really focus on acute risk compounds, so things that you definitely don't want to be inhaling. So cyanide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, but there's no sensors right now that are commercially available for the chronic carcinogens. So previously on our first, uh, go around with these sensors back in October of 2018, where we tested them at the city of Miami. We had the sensors attached to the railing of a controlled live fire training evolution, class A controlled live fire training. And we were able to see that the sensors reacted to uh, whenever this door up here was open, let out smoke. Uh, but moving on, what we wanted to do was really assess inside the warm zone, because in the hot zone, being so close to that burning area, it, firefighters are really you know, they're, they have their turnout gear on, they have their SCB on, they're, they're really as protected as they can be. And what we found was when attaching the, the sensors to a rover to mobilize it, uh, which is basically a little RC monster truck that we kind of uh, reverse engineered a little bit, we were still able to see dips and responses in the readings for sensors uh, in different areas of the warm zone, depending on the fire intensity, which way the wind was going, and the ambient temperature. Since then, we've been trying to integrate these sensors into firefighter medical bags, basically make them so that they don't encumber firefighters and they can be easily taken, in, taken into active fire scenes so that they can be used to readily uh, affect the firefighters' behaviors and uh, you know, hopefully pull them out of exposure's way. Over time, what we managed to do is uh, achieve a reduction in the sensor footprint, make it smaller, make it more durable inside of a Pelican case, and integrate wireless data reporting via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so in order to increase uh, its usefulness in, in uh, field deployment settings. Uh, one of our recent sensor deployments was at Coral Springs Parkland during a controlled live fire training evolution. And right here in this red circle, it's kind of hard to see because we took this picture from real high up, uh, is the sensor box. And what we find is a rising sensor response even out to where firefighters are doing gross on-scene decon. So this really tells us about the use of these, fire, of these uh, active fire monitoring sensors in the future. Moving on to biomonitoring techniques, this is, uh, you know, we've been talking so far about external exposures at fire scenes, post-fire audits, and prescribed burns. Uh, this is just one half of the puzzle. There's a need to learn about the internalization of these exposures as well. This has primarily been the goal of the work of my colleague Alexia, who's been doing using biomarkers of pH exposure to non-invasively assess uh, the internalization of firefighter exposures through the analysis of urine. The advantage for using uh, urine collection is that unlike, unlike blood draws or biopsies, it's non-invasive. 
be directly and uh, specifically associated with exposures to pHs and can also be used to time the clearance of these compounds from the body. So the study population that she used was uh, 21 new, new recruits, uh, including those uh, participating at baseline and live fire training and after live fire training exercises, 25 active firefighters uh, before and after their 24 hour shifts and 21 controls, uh, just commercially available urine that we can use. And the analytical protocol is not all that dissimilar from what we use for wristbands. Instead of having a solid phase though in the wristband, we have a liquid phase that we extract pHs from the urine from. Uh, the sample is then cleaned up and then put through GCMS. So first for the recruits, uh, they were uh, tested during baseline, during a class A live fire training, during a class B live fire training, and then for that class B live fire training, we were also able to collect urine 18 hours post training. Uh, what we found was significantly higher uh, pH burden in the urine after a class B fire. But predictably, the median concentration of pHs went down after uh, 18 hours after the burn. In all cases, though, pH concentration was significantly higher than the baseline. For active firefighters before and after their 24-hour shifts, we found that urinary pH concentrations were significantly higher after the firefighters' 24-hour shifts, and with a p-value of 0 0.007. Uh, the significance became even higher when we considered those firefighters who actually reported going to fire-related calls and separated them out from those who did not go to fire-related calls, where we found an even more significant difference between uh, pH levels in the urine after or post-shift compared to pre-shift for those who went to fire-related calls, and really no significant difference for those who went to non-fire-related calls. In this chart, the size of the bubbles indicate how much exposure uh, was observed in the urine from these firefighters. Uh, so each of these bubbles scales up with more exposure, and each of these uh, levels on the vertical, the y-axis here, is indicative of the number of fire calls. So we've already established that there's a significant difference in the amount of exposure that's been sustained by firefighters when reporting to fire calls versus not. That's pretty evident even on this chart. But the number of fire calls doesn't fully explain differences in pH exposure. And we think this might be due to other factors, such as the scale of the fire event that they went to. If they went to just one fire event, was it a very big one? Uh, what type of fuel was burning? What was the role of the firefighter? Were they the driver operator? Did they go into the building? Uh, and the level of hydration as well might have affected urinary concentrations. Another facet of work that my colleague Alexia did was on in vitro techniques for assessing aqueous film forming form AFFF toxicity on human kidney cells. So AFFFs are used in the fire service for very, very difficult fuels like jet fuel, very flammable, very volatile uh, fuels. Uh, they work by encapsulating the fuels and wetting them, make them easier to wet and knock down. So suffocating them from the oxygen that they use to burn and then also cooling them down so that they can't keep burning. Now production of AFFFs that have been used and that, I've been, that contain highly toxic PFAS has been banned since 2015, at least uh, in terms of the chemicals perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctane sulfonate. But of course, with these chemical companies, they will produce other variants of these chemicals that can be used in more modern forms. And when PFAS are exposed into the body, uh, they're called forever chemicals for a reason. They're extremely stable in have and have physiological half-lives of years, uh, depending on what species they're for. Uh, so knowing that they have adverse environmental and health impacts, especially with relation to the kidney and kidney function, uh, where certain toxicology studies have indicated that, uh, that um, uh, increases in serum PFAS concentrations can lead to elevated risk for kidney cancers, it was uh, kind of the natural next step to try and assess the toxicity the toxicity of certain AFFFs with a human kidney cell line. So on the right here, uh, this uh, three by three grid shows uh, cells that are being imaged with fluorescence. Uh, more green means happier cells. Um, and what we find is that at the concentration that is recommended for, uh, for the use of these films, 3%, uh, this affected the kidney cells quite terribly, killing a lot of them off. There's barely any green here. For foam B, there's a little bit more. For foam C, there's a little bit more. Even at concentrations that are tenfold lower 
at 0.3%, that than what is recommended for fire for fire suppression. There's a pretty significant evidence of toxicity for these films. Um, and that's in comparison to 0%, which is just water. So as far as ongoing research and milestones go, so some upcoming research that we're planning on doing. Uh, one uh, one uh, thing that I mentioned early on is uh, that a lot of firefighters' exposures are attributable to diesel combustion from exposure directly from the engine, especially for the driver operator who's usually stationed right by it. And to assess these exposure, there's a few factors that we'd like to evaluate with our firefighter partners up at Palm Beach County. Uh, one is the location of the fire engine. So is it in the apparatus bay or is it outside? Uh, is it being warm started? Was it on previously and is now being restarted or is it full start? Uh, what tier is it? So more recent fire apparatuses have more stringent regulations as to their exhaust and also the use of aftermarket exhaust filters as well, uh, whether that yields a lower exposure to diesel exhaust and the uh, toxic compounds that are inside of it. Another uh, um, pet project of mine is to analyze exhaled breath and wildland firefighters. So as I said before, uh, wildland firefighters have very little access to uh, respiratory protection. A lot of it is due to the fact that it's too cumbersome and the respiratory demands of being in a wildland firefighter, being in a wildland fire are simply too great to, uh, to be using these um, uh, respiratory protections. It's simply just too, too, too much stress on the body. Uh, the analysis of wildland firefighters' breath may reveal compounds that are indicative of their exposures. And anecdotally, I've heard from these wildland firefighters noting that the secretions from even days or a week after a wildland fire, that they'll be uh, sneezing out mucus that's still really dark. So what we hope to see are indications of, well, I shouldn't say hope to see, but what we expect to see are indications of what sort of oxidative stress and inflammation is being caused by these compounds in the exhaled breath and also potentially parent exposure compounds or their metabolites. And then lastly, there's some new work that we're working on to assess long-term effects of exposure in firefighters. This is done by my colleague, Marshley Stewart. Uh, and her idea is to combine several biomarkers as well as occupational and demographic characteristics in order to produce a nomogram, kind of a rubric for uh, assessing risk in firefighters based on, uh, based on their exposures. So some milestones that we've got, um, current publications that we have already that you can look up. Um, this, this meeting is definitely being recorded. That you should be able to Google or YouTube um, FCI seminar November 2023. You'll be able to find these. And for upcoming publications, we've got quite a few as well, especially on fire investigators that we just submitted, a uh, publication on wildland firefighters that's in progress, and then some other publications, including one on solid state sensors that is also in progress as well. So with projects this big, you end up with lots and lots of people to thank. Um, if I named every single one, I'd go over time. Um, and I'm sure I've missed some names from the past and present, and I don't think I would have been able to fit all of them on this uh, list. But there's definitely some people I'd like to thank, especially uh, my mentor, Dr. Sylvia Downert, um, and others, Dr. Alberto Caban Martinez, who's right here in the panel, Dr. Safna Deo, and Dr. Natasha schaefer -Sali. Um, from the South Florida de fire departments, the chiefs that I've worked with, including all these uh, the fire investigators, including Jeff Colley, uh, and from the Florida Forest Service, the folks I've interacted with in order to, um, to uh, conduct field experiments at wildland fires. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the funding from the state of Florida for the appropriation to the UM Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative. Uh, the pilot project training grant that I received from the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and, uh, Occupational Health and Safety, and also pre-doctoral fellowship funding from ULINK. And with that, I'll go ahead and close. Thank you all for your attention, and I'll go ahead and field some questions. Awesome job, Umar. That was really that was really great. That was really great. Um, so for our attendees that are online, you are welcome to. Uh, insert any questions that you want into the uh, webinar chat or the uh, Q&A, and um, we'll ask those questions of, of Umer. So feel free to um, pop in those questions uh, into either of those two spaces that you'd like to ask them. 
Um, so Umar, I'd like to take moderator's prerogative and ask you a question. I think, you know, you've, you've been working with firefighters now for, for several years. Um, and I know you started off first with um, sort of our structural career firefighters um, and have been now moving on into to wildland. I think what are some of the challenges um, that you're encountering in sort of objective measurement of wildland uh, firefighting. I know that there's some some similarities with prescribed burns, which give you some more controlled environments for those measurements compared to real life wildland firefighting. But are there any unique from your perspective in quantitatively assessing carcinogenic exposures there that you? Um... Well, primarily, I'd say because um, wildland firefighting uh, being so mobile as it is uh, going over such a large area of 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 um of land uh, even prescribed burns are still acres in in uh in in size uh so we really need to have systems that are able to kind of assess uh firefighters exposures that can really tolerate being taken all across you know a large area of land um and this is in contrast with structural firefighters where we're able to kind of like stay at a certain area away from a controlled live fire training this is really not the case maybe you know, we can venture a little bit into a prescribed burn situation. But um, I think that's the biggest difference between wildland firefighting and structural firefighting. Okay, well, we have two new questions that I'd wanna um, pose to you. So one um, comes from Daniel uh, Barto. Is there any recommendations on how far warm and cold activities should be set up based on the research that you've done? So, this is a little bit tough to answer because every fire situation is different. Um, I, I can't give a certain number. Uh, I can't necessarily say that, you know, after 50 feet or 75 feet is safe because depending on the fire situation, it might not be. Um, what it really comes down to is hopefully being able to assess the presence of VOCs in the future and assess the presence of these carcinogenic, carcinogenic compounds in the air such that you can avoid uh, where the smoke is blowing where these compounds are going. Um, that's that's about as much as I can say. This is really a problem that we're still wrestling with. Yeah, and there's still new and developing research in this space, so I agree. Um, okay, the next question is coming from our very own Jeff Polly. So is there any prognosis on the commercial availability of the mobile PAH detector? So that's a great question for this team because they're they're well, good at, at this, yeah. And I, so our, especially the biochem, the biochem team is very, very involved with translational research and we like making products and getting them to market. That's a hallmark of ours. Um, we're still working on it. It's, I think um, producing the blueprints is actually a deliverable for period two of this year. So potentially putting this out into uh, uh, a, a factory for production or a company that can produce it. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, are there any other questions that we have for Umer um, this afternoon? Okay, seeing as none, um, I want to thank again Umer um, and the biochemistry team again for their support um, and you know unwavering engagement in the firefighter cancer initiative. Um, it's really amazing work, especially with the subgroups, uh, being able to address all different types of carcinogenic exposure assessments across different subgroups. So we're th I'm thankful to you, um, Umar, Dr. Donner, and Deo Dikichi, and others in the biochemistry team, um, especially to our trainees um, as you're advancing this science and then our future in research for firefighter health and safety. So thank you very, very much. So this concludes um, this month's uh, seminar session. Um, next month, our closing one for the end of the 2023 year will be yours truly. I'll be giving you an update on the PFAS postal mail study um, that we'll be presenting, I think, on December. If Hegla can remind me, I think it's December 12th. Uh, 12th. Awesome. Okay. Thank you all very much and have a great week. Bye. Appreciate you all. Bye, everyone. Take care.